man, it's, it's truly been a pleasure to be able to get to speak with you over the last couple of days. But uh, for our listeners who kind of want to get to know you, I think most of us do a little bit, but can you, can you run us through a short snapshot of you know, how you got into coaching and where you're at? Perfect. There we go. Are we good? Um, yeah, you know, I got into coaching uh, a little bit by accident. Um, it was in 2004. I was a senior transfer into Long Beach State. Uh, played on that, that, that was a role player on a really, really good team. <clears throat> and then I had one year left of school and I had to finish my fifth year, left the school. Um, Coach Weathers, I, I do remember, called called during the summer and said, hey, I got this opportunity to be a, an undergraduate assistant. What do you think? And I was like, you know what? No, I'm going to start my life. I'm going to go on and do something else. And then he called back um, and I said, no, again. Um, and then the third time he goes, hey, this is the last time I'm calling you. Um, I want you to be a part of this. I think you have a chance to coach down the road. No one really knows truly, but I do think there's something you possess to, to, to be out here with us. And I said, the only way I can do it is, is I need to try and make a little bit of cash and, and find something um, to just hold over, you know, um, as, as we all go through our end of our playing career, our parents are only going to keep us on the payroll so long. So my, my parents want, were really good about it, but they just wanted me to show that I can hold down something other than baseball. So I got a job at, uh, at that point, it was called British Petroleum. So BP, who obviously runs Arco, um, down at the docks in Long Beach, I worked from 5 a.m. to noon every day. Um, and then I would go to the field at 12.30, or I would leave the docks about noon, uh, grab a bite to eat or something, and then um, head, to the, head to the campus field for practice. And, and that was it. So I was an hourly employee. Uh, um, we were, they were nice enough to work with my schedule, um, and that was in 05. Um, and after the 05 season, I don't know if I got fired, but I didn't get rehired. Um, Coach Willers told me that I needed to get out. Uh, I've been there for two years, one year as a player, one year as an undergrad, and he said, hey, I basically need to start and find my way. Um, find my way. How, how do I really want to coach? So I went to my junior college at Cerritos College uh, the fall of 05. And then I got engaged in the fall of 05 um, at 23 years old and uh, made $5,000 uh, 05, 06. And I know a lot of you guys can attest to that for sure. Uh, made five grand. And then at the end of the 06 season, uh, Coach Weathers called me back and says, hey, I want you to come back. I want you to be the volunteer, which was great. You know, I mean, there's only so many volunteer jobs open in the world. And um, I was fortunate to, to land one of them. But there again, the money problem still still was an issue. So at that point, um, I was going to get married that fall. That fall. And so I went back to the docks uh, to BP. And basically from the fall of 05, through 2010 spring, which is June, um, I worked from five to noon every day um, and then went to the field and, and made it work. Man, that's, that's tough, but I, I'm sure uh, the listeners <clears throat> who have been in the college setting have, can definitely empathize with that. And For sure. uh, obvi obviously, um, we've got guys that are listening live now, but this, this may be listened to in a couple of months. And and we're currently going through the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And so all of us are at home at the moment. So tell, talk to us about what your daily routine's been, because I, I truly think that we can use this time to uh, get a leg up on our competition because we're literally, the playing field is completely even right now. So what has been your daily routine? Is there any resources that you've enjoyed? And, and kind of, I guess what I'm asking is how, how have you kept your sanity? Well, the sanity part's a little difficult. We got two dogs and four kids, uh, so our house is super. Our house is super busy, uh, mm -hmm. but really, I, I think uh, I've, I've just enjoyed being at home. Um, I, I don't think my wife's enjoyed me being at home. Um, I think probably for the first few days, she was like, "Oh, this is cool," and then now it's day whatever it is, and 
she's ready to throw me out on the street um, mm -hmm. or send me back to work or whatever. But, um, you know, just I've just enjoyed getting my family back essentially for a little bit um, and being a part. Not that I don't I mean, I'm not going to pretend I, I don't get up and make breakfast and I don't, I'm not making coffee and, um, you know, I'm not doing any of that and I'm not mm -hmm. doing the kids schoolwork. But. Um, I've just enjoyed the interaction, um, seeing them, seeing what they're doing. Uh, try not to screw with with their daily routine because we all know as as people that that are working, you know, sometimes we we do more harm than good inside our own house. Um, so I, I get involved a little bit where I can, um, but it's been cool to, you know, my two daughters are in competition dance team. So watching, you know, I get a chance to watch their virtual workouts. Um, okay. My boys, they're, they're crazy. Uh, they'll, they'll be on here at some point throughout the day or throughout this podcast, I would imagine. But, um, you know, they're doing boy things. They're, they're, I mean, they're running. They're, they're, we just built a BMX bike track in our yard, um, which, which was really cool. Um, so that's that's done it was done last night so that that's kind of been my my wife wants me to like redo the fence and do this so i i instead built the bike track um <laughs> i don't know if it's more for me or for the boys but uh we built that and then that's really it and then getting on zooms you know i think this is a difficult time um and I think what you can do right now is just basically spread positivity i mean the world's in a in a difficult place and and somewhere that is un, uncharted waters and um I, I think you just gotta look at it as an opportunity and that that's what that's where i come from um where i where my college baseball was even going back to cerritos college was everything's just an mm -hmm. opportunity so what opportunity are we doing right now um and for me with our program it's it's a chance to to zoom and i, I don't do that very much but I'll tell you what, it, Zooms make you become a pretty good listener. Um, right. And that's something that I think we all can work at. So whether it's with our staff once a week or every other, whatever it is, whenever we basically need to. Um, and then with your team, you know, you, you have a chance to have this dialogue in a different setting. You got to be able to watch your, you, your body language a lot more because we have a tendency, right, to scroll through these things um, in any meeting, in any setting we're, we're doing. And we do it all. We're all at fault for it. but. Um, to be locked into 35 guys as we had a meeting yesterday was it, it was a great opportunity to just to learn and that, that's really what we're trying to do that's what we're trying to tell our guys is this, this is just an opportunity and what you do with the opportunities on, on you so what are you telling those guys at the moment because i i'm thinking you know we're we're keeping in touch with our players as much as we can and they're asking for advice on what they should do because there's different parts of the country and really the world that have different aspects of, of when they can go out, what they can do, uh, facilities that are open or closed. So what's been your best advice for your players during this time on how they can, again, one, keep their sanity because I'm sure they're biting at the bit and they're pretty upset over the lost season, but also how they can use this time to their advantage. Well, part of it is for them too is that they need to go back the first thing we told them was go back and enjoy your family um you know they're in the same boat a lot of us are in and they don't get that opportunity to whoever whatever spend time with grandparents parents um whatever i, I know it's all it's easier said than done right we're all we all say hey we got to do this we got to do that and we never really take the time to do it so that's the first and foremost is what we told them but now in terms of baseball stuff, I think there's a, there's a lot of, you got to get creative, um, whether it's, you know, you live on a hill and you can run up and down a hill 10 times. Um, you can walk backwards um, to stay in shape. You do, you can, you push ups, pull ups. I mean, you, you can just do so many things creatively, put a net in the garage and hit off the tee. Um, take a chance to break down some video on yourself. as something that I, I know guys probably do it more often than not now. Um, mm -hmm. but I also, I also told them too, it's an opportunity to reach out to some people that are around you that you don't get a chance to catch up with. Um, and just as I do, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to reach out to some of my peers and guys that, that I look up to and, and just try to get better in some way, shape or form. You may not be getting better physically per se, um, you know, but it's just, it's just as much getting better 
in, in a, in a better mental state, um, learning your body. Uh, for us, we were pretty banged up this year. Uh, we had 10 surgeries or 11 surgeries, I believe from August to, um, just through March or to March. Mm -hmm. Um, so for us is a little different opportunity to get healthy. Um, and it was, it was kind of one of those funny years and, um, but that, that's the big thing for our guys. I mean, I'm not going to push um, a whole lot of things, but I, I think right now they can get better just as good, whether it's going back and looking at stuff we hand out in our binders and, and really having a true grasp and understanding of, of what's going on. It's, it's, you know, we have a saying in our program, it's be extraordinary at the ordinary. I mean, um, for, for a lot of guys that, that do know me, um, I, I'm not really, I don't want to say I'm not outside the box, but I kind of stick to a plan, uh, and we'll get into some infield stuff later, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say I'm boring, but probably to some people, um, I, I do, I believe in that. I believe in that quote. Um, and I believe that will take you where you need to get to. And then at some point, you know, these are our kids and I know they're a good friend of mine, Fergie's on here and. Um, it's, you know, it's our job now to get these kids ready and then hand them off to somebody like him. And then he can, he can help them expand it as he gets them better into the professional baseball world. And it's, we're just all working together. And I think the more we can do that, the better our kids will be. Absolutely. And uh, so this was year five for you <laughs> at Nevada and you, yep. you had a couple of previous stops that uh, we're high, you know, obviously you're a high profile assistant at some high profile programs. And so you got the opportunity to put your stamp on uh, the Nevada program. And I think as, as assistants, we all have ideas of what we want to do if we get a head job someday. And so we're starting to create uh, our standards, our vision of what we would do when we're, whenever we started. And, and that, that part is really hard because I think it sets the tone for what your program is going to look like for the upcoming years. And so what did that vision look like for you? So let's say you accepted the job, you're excited, you're ready to rock. What did it look like for you? And what did you start at, with first? Because I think that's, again, that's a critical step, but it's something that unless you're in it, it's, it's something that we can all learn from, but it's also something that's really hard to, uh, I guess, anticipate. Yeah, and I was I was super fortunate <clears throat> to be uh, where I was. You know, I went to, like I said, I, I, I got through Long Beach in 2010. And then uh, basically what happened was I, I didn't get hired um, for the full-time job. Um, so uh, the assistant took over and then basically uh, went his, dip, his own way. So I, I would be remiss mm -hmm. to, to if I didn't mention um, the reason why I am sitting here is because of John Savage. And there's – there's uh, it's not 98% true. It's not 99% true. It's a hundred percent. The reason I'm in this chair now is because of coach and um, what he did for my family, uh, what he did for my career. He, he's, he gave my career a heartbeat because at the end of 2010, I went into Alaska and that was it. <clears throat> you know, I, I told my wife, Hey, we'll coach during the summer and then we'll, we'll kind of see what happens. Um, and John called in, in middle of July after they were they made that Omaha run in 10 and so um I was super fortunate to, to learn under him and and everything um that he that he has built at UCLA I mean as we all know it's a power um and there's there's no question about it but I, I think I, I always compare like the head coaching part to what it was like when you get when you got married I think you had your idea of marriage um and you looked okay. up to different people um uh, you know, you know, we all had friends that are married 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And normally the people that are 20 years into their marriage, we wanted to be like them because they had it all figured out and it looked cool. And uh, But you really don't know what you got into um, until you're sitting in the chair. I will say the chair's a lot lonelier at the top than it was at the bottom, um, <laughs> you know, because everything does fall on you. But I do think that you have – that's where you have to fall, lean on your experience. And that was one of John's big things at UCLA was you have to lean on your experience. Um, and so basically all I tried to do was take what we did at UCLA and take John's standards – um, and just a lot of it was applied to what we're doing at Nevada. I mean, there's not a whole lot of things, to be honest with you, that have changed. I mean, you know, you can go into a few things. One of them's culture. Um, two is leader. 
Um, and these are just kind of things that we try to do in our program. Three are captains, four is competition, uh, five is accountable and ownership. Um, six is engaged in roles. And I know that's something, like um, that's something that people don't really identify a whole lot, but I will tell you this, um, as even catching up with a mentor and a great friend of mine in coach, um, all we talk, we do talk about 13 and, and how we, um, won in 13, we were in Omaha in 12 and what we did mm -hmm. in 15 and a lot of things that come up is roles. And that's something that people don't, I, I don't think programs do that enough. Um, and I know it's something we've, we've actually messed around with it to where um, we try to go no roles. And then all of a sudden, you know, then you have roles and there's no, there's no, you know, it's, there's no coincidence that the most success we've had in our program is when we've had um, a lot of roles, bullpen roles, defensive roles, pinch hitter roles. Um, you know, eight is confidence and awareness. Um, nine is getting better and being a student of the game. Um, I mean, there's just, you know, um, sorry, that's eight, but nine is keeping that edge in standards. Um, mm -hmm. And those are, those are things that we're doing. And the last thing we do talk about um, that we do talk about within our staff, because I think you have to, is coaching staff development. Um, and that's number 10 because – we're only as good, A, we're only as good as our players, um, B, and B, we're only as good. It's like 1A and 1B, and we're only as good as the people around us. And my job is to move on our staff. Um, you know, that's, that's our – move on the players into professional baseball, move them on into their degree, get their degrees, and then um, obviously we want our, our staff to um, move on and be head coaches or be a recruiting coordinator somewhere else or – if they, you know, we had a coach that was actually our third base coach and I knew he uh, always wanted to be a pitching coach. He had that opportunity to go be a pitching coach this past summer at slow. So um, those are, those are big deals and just some, some things within our program that we do talk about and that what I think consists of a championship program. I love that. And so I, I wrote a couple of them down and, and if our listeners want us to go or want you to go into uh, depth, drop some, Drop yeah. some questions over there on, on the right side. But the first one, and, and again, this is me thinking out loud. So um, this one, is, it would be really tough is uh, the engaged in roles part. Now, I'm thinking of the conversation that I would have with a three and four hole hitter um, <laughs> saying, hey, you're going to play third base every day and you're going to hit four hole. Perfect. Got it. Love it, coach. Thank you. But then I'm thinking about the guy who's not playing every day that I'm like, well, you may uh, get in a bat here and there. I mean, how, so how do you how do you get buy-in from that guy to really own that? And I'm sure it's maybe it's a conversation that you're saying, if you do this real well, you can get more of an opportunity, but mm -hmm. uh, just kind of take us through the guys that don't play every day and how you get them to buy into those roles. Well, I, I think part of it, you know, I think part of it is they, they have to, they have to admit to themselves where they're at on that particular team. Um, you know, I, and one of, one of the biggest, um, examples I have was in and I'll use 2013 um, was we went 10 on the postseason um, it was an incredible run and we had a guy by the name of Christoph Bono who was our late inning defensive replacement now um, Christoph had you know he didn't he had limited at bats one year the next year I think it was like 17 at bats 18 at bats and the year he had 18 at bats was the year that he was a defensive replacement because he can do so many different things. But I think for them as players, and it's our job to help point them out, they have to admit to themselves where they're at on this given team. And we all know they all want, they all want to hit in the three hole and they want mm -hmm. to play shortstop, right? I mean, so did I, but Tulowitzki stopped that in college too. So it's like, what was I supposed I mean, I had to admit to right. myself like, hey, I, I got it. You know, I, I kind of understand it. And I think, I think too, they got to accept responsibility for it. Um, I think they got to they got to accept responsibility and basically own and be the best at what they're doing. Um, they get, so I wrote down embrace their role. They got to they got to embrace um, where they're at and be the best at it because <clears throat> we can't have nine shortstops. I mean, that's there's one shortstop. There's one center fielder. Um, 
but something that we do too, we always keep track uh, throughout the fall. I mean, stats are what they are, but I think they do tell something. Um, and, and we try to do, we, we play, we do traditional stats and then we play, um, we have this, it's kind of a competition thing uh, where you get points in base, helping them learn the game and move, you may get three points for moving the runner over. You may get minus two points for a base running mistake, you know, sec, runner at second base getting thrown out third base with nobody out ball of dirt, right? You may get minus two points for that. Um, but helping them learn the game, but also th those are avenues to, to say, hey, here's where you're at at the moment right now. Does it mean I don't want you to accept it per se, but I want you to embrace it. And I think there's a huge difference in doing that. Um, so that's really what we're – that's really what we try, um, what we, how we try to, to start the discussions. Um, and the, la the last one, um, or there's two things, two other ones, is I, I put two worlds, one baton. You know, and what I mean by that is I think there is two worlds, right? There's the pitcher world and the position player world. We all battle. We've all battled that, you know, <laughs> but the one baton is, is the team. Right. But then then if you dive deeper into that, there's the if you just go on the position player side, there's the starters and then your role players or slash bench guys. So there's two worlds, one baton. And really, well, you're you're trying. Everybody does have a role. Um, everybody has a role and roles grow. Um, and, and that's the one thing where you talk about not accepting it um, just because you're the ninth inning defensive replacement um, in the first two weekends doesn't mean you're going to be the ninth inning defensive replacement in the last in the last game of the year and I think um, we've all been on really good teams where we've seen that happen so that's that's really how we try to identify it within our program and with our players. Well, that's fantastic and I, I, again thank you for going into into depth with that because I think that's that's a really that's a hard conversation to have if you don't uh, think about it forwardly. Uh, another one that that I've been really interested in and that's coaching development and Ryan uh, Phillips asked this on the sidebar. Uh, just kind of what's your go-to for that because I think this is something that's gaining traction uh, because I think you know in the past assistant coaches who have wanted to uh, be head coaches someday kind of had to go on their own and now it's, it's more of a mutual effort like you mentioned you want to prepare them for the roles that they're going to go to eventually mm -hmm. so what how how do you do that intentionally uh, do you send them to clinics do you do it by example do you do all of the above none of the above but just kind of how are you doing that for them well to I mean a there again I, I've had some really I've only I've only worked for two head coaches um, I've been really fortunate in that regard. Um, and I lean on those guys every day. Um, so that's number one. Um, and number two, anybody that uh, is working in our program, whether it be a manager, um, an undergraduate or graduate, they have access. And those two guys and Coach Weathers and John Savage have been unbelievable. And Mike is now out of the game. Um, but, you know, as we know, Coach Savage is still is still running his full-time program and he is mm -hmm. still taking the time to take some coaches of ours under his wing and bring it. And so I, I can't take all the credit um, for sure, but I, I've tried to anybody that's that I have access to, I want our staff to have access to. And I know, <clears throat> I, I don't know how many people do do that. Um, I don't really make them go to clinics or anything like that, but I do, I do try to give access to anybody um, that I can get access to, whether it's a baseball coach, whether it's Eric Musselman, the Arkansas basketball coach, um, wh whomever it may be, um, that, that's part of it, right? Because we're all in this community together. And so I can't take full responsibility on, on, on doing that. But there are a few things that, that bullet points that, that, that I think is important in coaching staff development. And the first one is hire coaches smarter than you. <laughs> um, and that's the biggest one. Um, I think you need that. I think you need coaches around you that will offset your personality. So that's part of you knowing yourself, um, knowing who you are and what you are and then what your team will need. Um, you know, and a perfect example is we had a chance to hire Troy Buckley as our pitching coach um, this year. And 
some people may look at that <clears throat> as like, wow, or the other part is, man, he's been a head coach for 12 years and been in pro ball, in and out of pro ball, um, and been coaching a lot longer than you. Is that intimidating to you? But my job, A, number one, is the program. Um, and so I need, I need to hire the best guys for the program. And so that's, that's part of why we hire Troy. Um, but, and then going off of that, I think for them to develop, they need to be loyal, they need to be competent, and they need to, they need to respect your program. Um, and those are three things that if they don't have, I think you're going to struggle in a program um, being assistant, <clears throat> having assistant coaches, because it's really easy in today's world to be an assistant, but always look elsewhere. I think you're seeing that quite often. And the way social media <clears throat> is playing a part and has taken off, I think that's something that um, – that's hard to do. And the number one thing John told me when he hired me is all she said was, all I need you to do is help our program win. If you help our program win, you will get yours at the end. Mm -hmm. And I, I can honest to God tell you for the five years I was with John, I didn't look elsewhere. Um, I would, I, I, I did, I didn't look into this job, that job, this job. When, when I was ready, he would tell me, that I was ready to, um, I just, I coached third and did the recruiting and the infield stuff there. When he was ready and he thought I should go do the offense and it was a good place to go to a school, then he would have told me. Or like Nevada, he, he, I'll never forget, I was out recruiting in Florida and I called him right away and I said, hey, they called me. He goes, I know. Um, he goes, well, you're ready. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm ready. I say, so let's, you know, so then we dove, we yeah. dove a lot deeper into that. And um, <clears throat> so I know I kind of got off on a tangent, but those are three things yeah, I, I think loyal competence and respect. Um, you know, the other one is, you know, go over every aspect of your program with these guys, let them inside what you go through on a daily basis. I, and I'll be the first to admit, I, I'm probably 50, 50 on that. Um, I'm a, I'm a really private person um, when it comes into that. But as I've grown over the years and I've had people around me to help me grow, um, <clears throat> it's not a weakness to, to show inside, inside outs of what you deal with every day. And I think that's one thing I thought it was. Um, I thought it was a weakness to show weakness to your staff um, or to your peers or whatever. And it's really just a strength. Um, it's a strength and, and you have the courage to grow and have people around you to help you. So that was something that we do start doing um, is I let our guys in on everything. And, and I am fortunate I have a, a guy that's been a head coach that understands mm -hmm. that. Um, but I also had a, have another assistant in, in Abe Alvarez who's played at the highest level um, who understands that as well and seen a lot of different things that we haven't seen uh, the cutthroat part of uh, the business side of professional baseball or, or whatnot. Um, you know, so we go over every aspect. We bunker in for about four days um, and we don't, I don't let those guys leave. We normally go to a house somewhere. Uh, we mm -hmm. live in, in one of the best cities in the world. So, and we have Lake Tahoe, which I think is the best city in the world. Um, so we go up to Lake Tahoe and, and go on the lake for three days or four days and we bunker in. Uh, no phones, um, and we go over every aspect from budget to, um, you know, the, the, not the easy stuff, but the fun stuff and is going over your team, um, mm -hmm. you know, get families involved. I think that's something, um, really my wife's helped me with that because I was always pretty separate, um, really separate actually. And then as I started to grow and I'm going to, Fergie's on this call, but, um, I'm going to point to him and, and he was somebody that I always – I was like, man, how – he always has his family involved. How do you do that? And I was always like, no, you can't do that. You got to go – it's baseball. And then my family's like way over here. But really the only reason I can do what I'm doing is because of my family. So um, we've gotten better at that. So we go for four days, every aspect of the program, then the last three days. So it's a seven-day trip. The last three days, significant others are involved. Uh, no kids, because um, I, I don't want my four kids running around. Uh, but but we try to get pretty intimate with um, with their significant others, because um, 
that's a huge deal. You know, I, I think your family mission carries over to your work mission. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's no question about it. So, and that, that, that's part of it. Um, surround yourself with the best I talked about. Um, run it like a major league baseball organization, I think. I think you have to think about that. And, and, I, and I think the best guys that are doing it at the highest level do that, whether it's um, a college basketball program, they run it like an NBA program um, or organization. I think in baseball, we have to run it like a major league baseball organization, and we try to do that. Um, improvements and adjustments, don't be afraid to ask your assistants for that and give them the platform to speak. Um, give them the platform to speak to your team. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is one message for sure. Um, and, and I do, we always meet. <clears throat> so at the end of practice, our staff will always meet. I'll get everybody's opinion. Um, and then I do deliver the message to the team. But after my message is delivered, I do always ask our guys in front of our team, hey, do you guys have anything? And that's, that's a way for our team to understand that I, it's, that I really trust my staff. And these guys are just because I have the head coach title, I'm not any more important than, than the guys next to me. So if they have something, hey, by all means, please say it um, under obviously the umbrella of what we just talked about. Um, you know, understand the pitfalls, right? Understand – understand the pitfalls of of everybody around you under understand you got to understand that stuff um and accept the responsibility for it um ask ask uh, ask your hitter your hitting coach let's say what they see on the pitching side ask your pitching coach what they see on the hitter side there's a constant dialogue and feedback and the one thing i've learned over the years is nobody's wrong you know, that's the one thing I think we, and I, I'm at fault for this too. You know, you, you may have the undergraduate coach. Um, he's not wrong. He's just said it a lot differently than what you would convey it, but give them a platform to speak and never really criticize him publicly <clears throat> in front of your, your staff. You know, that's something one-on-one -on -one that you have to go to them and say, Hey, here's what I think you were trying to say. Here's what I would do. As we can see, here's my youngest guy right here. Um, hey, you're missing out on some awesome pancakes, it looks like, in the background. And, well, he, he's a snacker, too, man. I don't know. <laughs> he, he never eats a full meal. I don't know if I should, like, admit that publicly. But there's, like, it's like four bites and then it's Cheez-Its or something else. But uh, so, you know, there's, there's, that's part of the platform you want to give your coaches a lot, uh, and younger guys especially. Allow them to speak allow them because you're trying to develop you know the the, the public speaking arena it's, and it's, this is where we're all on and this is where we're going um, and the last thing is ask for help ask for help you know I can't do everything um, and I can't be afraid to ask like I'm going to lose value if I don't do everything and I think that's part of it is you know you the fear always is that you're going to be looked a lot differently at a lot differently because you asked for help and that's not necessarily that's that's really far from the truth so that's a little bit of how we've dove that i don't know the right grammar but how we've dove into coaching development oh that's fantastic so you guys uh one thing that that i think we are all striving to do is is whenever and again i've never been a head coach so i'm looking at this uh, from the outside looking in but you have a standard that, that you want uh, your team to look like. And so what is that for you? Is it something that you involve those guys? You, I know you mentioned you guys go away for a week, but, and you, you have an idea of what you want, but do you, uh, do you ask them for input or is it just kind of, hey, this is what I want and this is what it looks like. Uh, within this umbrella, this is what I want from you guys. Or just basically, what, what are your standards and, and why did you pick those? Well, I think, I think number one, um, I think number one, um, and I went over some things that I do believe in our program, but number one right. is what does it look like, feels like, and sounds like? So that's number one. And I think, <clears throat> I think you got to stop. You got to start right there. No matter what you're doing. Um, it's, if it's in your own house. Um, if it's a discipline with your kids, if it's, if you own a business, um, if you're in the major league base, whatever, I, I think looks like, feels like, sounds like, what is that? Identify that. And that, that has to be your vision. Um, so that's number one. 
Um, and then as we get into our standards, um, and, and there's a few things. So as we get into our standards, I think number one for us as a program, um, you got to have a definitive mission. You know, okay. so I think the top layer is looks like, feels like, sounds like. And then, the, you know, those are the three, three pillars at the top. And then I break them down really into four things. Definitive mission, vision, expectation, and your standard. Okay. Um, and let me be clear, the standard's only going to run as deep as the belief in your program. And that's, by, that's from, and I know I'm a st I start at the end, but that's really from your staff and your players. Um, but what they believe is how your standard's going to go. And that, that's, that's, I've always thought that. Um, so now I'm going to jump back to my mission. Um, and and what, I've, what I've talked about with our team is basically the two things um, in our mission, the two things the program will, will promise you. We don't promise playing time. Uh, we don't promise you a number. Who cares? No one cares about that you're number two. Uh, no one cares that you're number 27. Um, no, one, no one cares. Um, but the program will make you a better man when you step foot off this campus in three or four years, and we'll be in, we'll be um, relentless in the pursuit of perfection. Okay? Those are our missions, and that's it. Those are, and so how that's pretty general and broad, but it, it allows for growth. Is is how I look at it that way. Um, so those are the, the when we get in our room, um, when we meet for the first time as a program. Those, that's the mission that I tell our guys. And the pursuit of perfection is school, baseball, and your personal life. You know, because mm -hmm. we all need help in all three aspects. Um, our guys help me grow with my kids, um, with my family, my personal life. My wife is huge into my growth as a coach. Uh, and therefore, that's, that's how I founded that mission um, and what we – and what I want Nevada baseball to be. Um, I think, too, the vision, uh, everything in the program needs to be crystal clear. Um, mm -hmm. See it in your mind. Believe it with your whole being. Um, and, and part of that is outworking anyone and everyone. Um, I think that's, that's, that's the vision of it. Um, you know, it's funny. I was uh, – yesterday I brought up earlier my daughter's doing virtual dance and, of course, social media, right, and – um, there's some people within the, the – I'm not a dance dad, but I'm close. I'm getting pretty close now that I'm at home. Um, <laughs> but I, I uh, Instagrammed something yesterday, and I basically told my girls, I say, girls, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. And that's, that's really what it is. And, you know, my 8-year-old doesn't really understand it, but my 10-year-old kind of did. And she's like, no, that, that's why, you know, we're doing this virtual. Because there was a lot of people within the community, they didn't want to – well, we don't need the virtual stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 we're doing it. We need it. And we're paying for it. Let's do it. Uh, <clears throat> so that's part of, that's just an example of outworking guys. But even what I tell our staff right now is I think you can outwork people. Um, and even competition, outwork your staff, outwork your own staff, be the first one to um, send the email in the morning. Um, you know, be the last one to send the text at night. I, I just little games within the staff uh, we try to do. Um, the expectation, and, and really, here's our expectation, and, uh, and it's basically I want 15 hours of, of school. Uh, I want a 3.0. Uh, I, I, I want you to be really good at what you can control. Mm -hmm. And all that takes zero talent. I'm not talking about baseball talent. That, that's my expectation. And if you can handle that, then you're going to be really good on the field. Um, and, and what I wrote down is the program is built off how good you can be with what you can control, you know, and it's a lot of what we're doing now. What are we doing right now? It's, you know, um, is it, is this a negative time? Yeah. It depends how you look at it. Is this opportunity to be at home and be a good learner or be with your family? Um, yeah, it is. It's a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity to see your work. It's a great opportunity to see how motivated you can be. Um, it's opportunity. And I think, and we can't control what the NCAA is going to do down the road. I cannot control tomorrow. I, so I, I do my best, and it's hard. I, I do my best to try not to forecast, are we going to be recruiting in June? Well, right now we're not. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, 
And I think, I think the standard in the last one is the standard. Um, and there's one thing it's pretty easy. Don't disrespect the program. I mean, don't disrespect the program. So what does that mean? I mean, you know, that means, <clears throat> I mean, that means be on time, you know, that means be on time for you, you know, respect for your program and yourself, right? Accountability, responsibility, liability, answerability, uh, work hard, great deal of effort, uh, preparation, got to be ready. You know, Dave Snow had this great saying, um, be, you got to be ready to be ready. You know, um, you got to be ready to be ready. And the other great saying he had is, and I can use it on this podcast right now, is be where you need to be when you need to be there. So right now we got to be in our podcast. Right now this is where we're at. And I, I just, I try to, those are two things I try to live part of our program with. Um, part of the standards is honesty, integrity, ethics, principles. Um, and then, like I told you earlier, your commitment to the standard will run as deep as your belief as to where we're going. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, but it's a fairly easy one. Don't disrespect the program as the standard. So, uh, you know, definitive mission, vision, expectation, and standard. Well, that's fantastic. And I think that, you know, no matter what level that we're at, I think it always comes back down to uh, mutual respect, respect for the program, like you mentioned, respect for each other. And uh, inevitably, um, and unfortunately, we're going to have players who don't quite buy in. And uh, I think today's players are being pulled in a lot of different directions. And uh, I think it from, from the hitting side, they've, they've all got somebody that they work with in the offseason or they work mm -hmm. with privately because, you, you know, you can't be around them as much as they would like and probably mm -hmm. as much as you would like. And for us in the offseason, they go home. And so – uh, I think a, a big thing is getting them bought into just and having a, a what, what, like you said earlier, a, a mutual baton. And so uh, dealing with players who aren't bought in, it's a really tricky subject because I think it's, I think it's really individualized, but what does that look like? Because it, it, and, and take this however you want, whether that's infield, whether that's school, whether that's hitting, but uh having a conversation with someone who's not quite bought in, uh, how do you go about that? And, and what's your best advice for regarding that? Yeah, that's, you know what, that's a tough one. Um, and, I, and I'm going to start off on, on, a, on two things that we talk about right away. So when our guys walk into our, our, our team room, um, the first slide that's up is place the needs of the team above my own. Um, and that's that's number one. Uh, and number two is if you are not prepared to receive honest coaching today, please go home. Um, and I do say please. Um, I don't. Uh, but those are two things that, that we start off right away um, with that. And with that being said, are you ever going to get 35 guys um, completely? Nah, I think it's tough. I think it's tough in the workplace. I think it's tough in the athletic. I think it's tough anywhere. But I think the number one thing that you need to understand is communication. Um, we are, we're in a time, uh, we're in a time right now where, you know, the hitting coach, let's say, you know, for, for me, for instance, right, I do the hitting at, at Nevada and then they do, they go home, they have two months without me, you know, so I, I would be really naive if I didn't think they weren't going to hit with somebody at home or, but I, I think that's where the communication with the player and what you expect from them and then ask them what they expect from themselves um, in terms of what do they need? Because if they don't feel what you're trying to do at any level, you, that's really what drills are for, right? Drills are for them so they can have a little bit of a different feeling. Um, but they need to understand their themselves and their bodies. And then – I think it's a great opportunity for us as coaches to be to communicate with at least at our level. Um, I know it's maybe you know different at the high school level, right? Because they got they don't have the hour rules that we have, and they can be with their guys a lot more. And I, and but I think for us, it's you got to communicate with the player, but be reach out to the guy that they're going to, and see if you guys all can get on the same page and say, hey, here's what I see. Because hey, we don't know everything. Um, we really don't. And that's something that uh, we've worked harder at. I, I don't necessarily 
you know, I, I think you always got to be, you don't want to compromise team, but mm-hmm. there is two separate entities, right? It's team offense. I must use the hitting side as there's team offense, but there's individual development, right? So I think you, you don't want to compromise team, yet you don't want to compromise um, and ask somebody to be a, a skill guy when they're really not a skill guy. That's not what's best for your team or program. Um, you know, so that's that's part of how, of how it looks like with us. Um, and it, what we've done, too, more this year is we've brought up more live video from the games, you know, and it's it's easy for us to criticize and say, why didn't you swing at that pitch? Um, where was that pitch? And then <clears throat> as oftentimes, right, sometimes the player and the coach do disagree, probably more than not, like, oh, coach, it was mm-hmm. – way far outside but no then you you bring the video and you're like oh man it was okay so what really happened and what transpired through your thought process how committed to the plan what was your approach that day what was our approach that day um as a team oh you know and and i just think it's a constant dialogue and that's that's the one thing um we just don't do enough of is communicating um via person to person um, I try not to communicate th- with our players through text and email. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, it, it's a lot of one word answers. I know that's probably, I'm probably maybe the minority in that part, but um, I rather have a phone conversation with them and I rather meet with them in person um, if I can. Cause I think, I, but I think it's all a lot of what you value and how you learn, um, but also how your players learn. Some are visual, some aren't. So mm-hmm. some you can send, um, I can send a Tulo fielding video to, and they're like, oh, yeah, coach, look at what this guy's doing. And some you can send it to, and they don't really know, well, what am I supposed to look at? Um, so that's why I just preach the constant communication part um, with your players and what they want to get out of something and what, sh- what you want to get out of it. Because like I said, I think no matter how you look at it, there's two worlds, one baton. I mean, that's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. Right, and at the end of the day, they they want to get better. I mean, I, I think that's line. something that I think that's something that we have to keep in mind too. Is when we get our ego involved uh, to think that whoever else they're working with isn't as good as us, that's when we get in trouble because they may be just as good, they may be worse, or they may be better, and they may be better for that player. Uh, and so I, I think just like you said, keeping that open line of communication, I really like that. Uh, but I, I want to get into some infield play. Uh, just Uh-oh. because I, I then this could be a whole hour segment in itself. Yeah. But uh, I think I still have. I think it was uh, collegiate baseball that did like this PDF TJ Bruce yeah. in Keystone infield drills. I think I still have that somewhere. <laughs> but kind of walk us through. I mean, I, I think we've all got like a daily drill set or daily daily <clears> things <throat> that we're working on uh, consistently. Uh, and and how do you build that into it? Are there any Keystone habits that that you build into their daily routines or any drills that you like um, that you're really into and for the most part um, yeah I just want to hear your thoughts on that (laughs) well I'm not I can get creative at times um, but I I do got to warn everybody and it's always this has kind of been the Long Beach way um, when Coach Weathers you know Dave Snow and Coach Weathers were there uh, was it was everybody always thought we had this secret um, infield thing going on there, and I and I do the number one secret was and I, was Bobby Crosby, um, Tulo Longoria, Espinosa, um, and then we had Devin Loman uh, was a third rounder, and then when I got mm-hmm. to UCLA, so we take the same approach, and I'll tell you the secret was Pat Valeka, Kevin Kramer, um, who are both in the big. So there's there's part of this there's the secret right there. I'm gonna tell you guys that right off. Um, but, and I think, I think within that, um, you know, there again, I think you got to really know your players. Um, and that's, I, I, I love, I'm way, I love infield stuff. Um, I love talking about it. I love learning about it. I love seeing what can work at this level and what cannot, um, not that it cannot work, but I do think. Um, you got to have an identity to what you're trying to create here. And I, I brought up a while ago about hitting is there's only so much I can do, I think, here before Fergie gets him in professional baseball, if that makes sense. And then he'll go there and expand him for there. 
because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to develop yet we're trying to win games within the system so <clears throat> there's a lot there's a lot that goes into it but I I think the core convictions um, and there's a few things of what we do is um, number one it's attitude and effort I mean bottom line and I know that's a pretty broad um, general topic uh, but the core convictions are be extraordinary at the ordinary trust the stakes um, and want the ball and, and I'll dive into those three um, and it's pretty simple uh, I'm extraordinary at the ordinary make the routine play I know that's boring um, I know that's not sexy I, I, I completely completely understand that um, and we just got through in fact with our staff dissecting infield defense and um, what we do because at this point in the year we're feeling 984 you know but of course the dialogue with your pitching coach is like well we got to get to more balls and I'm like I understand that. Um, I got it. But, you know, that's the pitching side versus the development and the fundamental side. Um, but we're just – we try to be – understand that they need to have a base layer of infield defense. And I know you can go into the back end, you go into the forehand, you can do all these, these drills. But if they don't have a foundation, when they keep growing and then they come crashing down because it does happen, they're going to go a lot farther than if they – than they, than they, if they did, if they did have a foundation, if that makes sense. Um, I, I only want them to, when they come crashing down, I don't want them to come this far. I don't want them to go all the way down. Um, handle the ball and keep the ball off the ground. I mean, that's whether that's, um, I've kind of taken some football stuff, um, you know, the coach throwing the football when they're stretching. Um, you know, I've taken a baseball and walked through stretch lines and tossing a ball to, to any defender. Um, outfield catcher, keep the ball off the ground, um, you know, and I think the one thing that I've grown in, in infield play um, is funnel or play through it, and I've heard the terms work through the ball. Uh, we use that term a lot, work through the ball. I've heard push through the ball um, or funnel, right? The funnel is really the main, the main stay in professional baseball, um, and there was a time where I wasn't a funnel person at all. Uh, I didn't think it could happen at this level, um, but that, that's part of growing and knowing your players um, on what they do need, um, what they may not be athletically enough, uh, athletic enough to work through it because it does. There's a little, there is a, a, some stop and some rhythm at times um, that you do use during that. They may need to funnel through it and you're trying to put yourself in, in the best position to catch and get the ball across the diamond. Um, trust the stakes. I think you got to know the percentages and play them. Um, you know, ironic I say that, and I live in Reno. Uh, but you got you got to know the percentages and you got to play them. Um, whether it's the back end, whether it's running through the ball, I will tell you uh, our program is really good at running through the ball um, in the six hole. We've always been that way um, from the time I started, and I think part of it is the lack of the back end um, that we do use. Um, and I, and I definitely, like I said, there was a time where I was like, you can't back in. I am definitely not there anymore. Um, I think it's just there again. I think it's knowing your players and, and there also is a time the, where you try to get creative where they can't handle maybe some of the foundational stuff. Cause it's hard. It's built off repetition and it's super boring. I'm telling you, um, you come out and watch us. And some of these guys that are on this call have seen us do certain things. Um, and it is, it, it's kind of stagnant at times. So we do get creative and, and try to, um, you know, maybe allow, you know, not allow, but say, hey, backhand and jump throw here and just try to expand the mind. Um, and then three is want the ball, separate offense and defense. There's a great drill I do during our inner squads. And it more, more happened. It happens one, one time. It happens every year in the fall with a younger player and they go out to the infield or the outfield and they start swinging the bat. So basically I run out there and I give them a bat and I take the glove. Um, and, and that's part of separate and they'll never do it again. Um, and they play in the inner squad that way. Um, but I want them to understand the difference of separating offense and defense. I mean, offense, you only get in high school, you could potentially get, right. If you get four at bats in high school, I think that's probably the top of the order or you've scored a lot of runs. Uh, in college, most of the time you do get four bats. So you get four times to change the game. Defense, you get nine innings to change the game. I mean, there's 
there, there's, um, there's something to be said for that. Um, and I think the other one, there's a quote I say, if I don't get mine, you don't get yours mentality from a defender part. Um, you know, so if I'm not going to get a hit, you're not going to get a hit. You're not going to get yours. Um, and I think you got to take it personal when players score. You know, a lot of teams, the best defensive teams I've been a part of, um, they've taken it personal. It's not that – it's not, oh, the pitcher gave up the home run or the pitcher gave up the base hit and it's his run. No, you take it personal as a defense. Um, and the last one is you got to anticipate. you got to use anticipation. Uh, so that's really part of our identity. Um, and as you can see, I mean, we can go into a lot of these things without even feeling the ball. Um, right. Right. But in terms of right. daily stuff, and, I, and I, I don't know if I'm going to jump ahead. Like I said, I can sit here for two hours and talk about it. Um, I, I did want to ask you about uh, building in anticipation because I think that that's something that's, that's underutilized. And uh, you look at some of the best fielders in the game, and, and some of some of them you played with, some of them you coached, but they're really good at anticipating where the ball is going to go, and they can get yep. to uh, different balls that other guys just can't. Uh, and I think that's what makes them elite. They they do make the routine plays, but they they almost have like this sixth sense of being able to know where the ball is going as soon as it hits the bat or even before. And so how do how do we build that into our infielders? Well, and that's that's a great question. Um, and I think I think part of what we we do, I mean, we also we do all the footwork stuff and all that, and that's part of our daily stuff. But part of it is is I split up. Um, I, I know we we've all seen different lanes. I, I don't really get into the lane part, but I do split up three different ways um, on where the ball's at. So um, basically, from the front of the pitcher's mound to the hitter, that's that's like area one from the pitcher's mound to the infield grass where the dirt and the grass meet, that's two. And then obviously what happens on the dirt is three. Um, so I really make them pay attention to what happens in each area. Um, and, and that's part of using your eyes. And, and I think, I think that can go into a whole nother thing. Um, if you want to get it, you know, if you want to talk and I eat the analogies like with recruiting, um, we try to make things up every once in a while on the recruiting side. Um, and, and I think we've all been at fault at that. Uh, you try mm -hmm. to make something that's really not there. And so the easiest thing I can tell guys in the recruiting side is just what are your eyes? And you really didn't need to. Uh, what's the speed of the ball? Um, you know, those are two things that if we try to create anticipation, um, but there again, if you want to go up back into the identity is what's the percentages of each play, you got to go through those things with these guys. You got to put, get them on a, the old school whiteboard, you know, going back to my days at Cerritos College. Um, we used to get on the whiteboard and, um, okay, there's a runner at first here. What happens if this, and you try to do all that. Um, and that will help them as they get better. And it's, it, and I'm telling you, it's not creative. Um, and I'll be the first one to tell you it's boring. Um, but I'm going to tell you what, there's something to it. And it's an easy way for them to see things. Uh, we, we watch a ton of video defensively, a ton. Uh, probably more defensive video than offensive video because I think personally, you know, it, as I do with my son, I'm at, I'm at fault at times too, but I, I just want him to hit. Um, but we actually do go through some defensive stuff for my six-year-old. and um, But they're brought up for 18 years learn how to hit. They're not brought up 18 years, learn how to play defense. Um, and that's – and when we go out and recruit, we want hitters as well. So we're all in this deal together. Um, but I, we watch a ton of video. Um, and the access that our players have um, to the guys that I've mentioned is just incredible. Um, and I think that's part of it. I think that's part of, of growing. They got full access to all those guys, um, you know, at any time. I mean, and those guys have been so gracious enough to to help with develop players and not be afraid to jump on a call, not be afraid to give out their number um, and do all that. So that I, I didn't probably answer your question as best as uh, as some people want it. But that that's that's really how we try to we try to do that, because if you can create anticipation, you create on field awareness. 
You know, and mm-hmm. if you can do those two things, man, God, you, you're going to have a really good player. Yeah, definitely. And another thing that I think sometimes it gets lost, uh, it's thing, you know, we talk about players today or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of good and bad that you could go in, in between all of them. Uh, but something that, that people say is, is there's, there's less of, uh, one, anticipation, but two, of uh, action between the action. And so that's something that I've been really curious about because when you, and it's rare almost whenever you can see like the high school player who really takes charge on defense constantly and it's constantly talking, you're like, man, that dude, that dude knows the game. Like that's, that's sure. really impressive. And so are, are there some different ways that we can teach that? Like the action between the action and what to say, when to say, or is it built in? Is it something that we could teach or is it just, I don't know, just kind of tell me your thoughts on that. Well, A, players aren't comfortable. You know, John always had this saying was, you got to be comfortable um, and you want players to be comfortable on the field. And, and so one, so I've expanded that a little bit just here. And part of what we do is, is I'll pick one guy uh, that day that he's only doing the talking, let's say in the infield. Um, so it's going to be the freshman shortstop that he's only going to do the talking for the whole day. Um, Zamora, we have, we have an all American, a third base. He's not allowed to talk for the day. Um, you know, the, none of these guys. So that's part of how we just try to cr- create communication. Um, and I think by hearing them talk is how they will learn, you know, because most of these guys, as, I, as I'm talking about infield play, 25 different things are popping into my brain about how to do this, how to do that. And that's part, of, that's, that's part of the way that I was taught on how to communicate and how to understand what the right thing to say, but I think how also to have your players know the right thing to say is any, any area needs to have its own verbiage. So infield, what's your program's verbiage? You know, um, for instance, we don't say step off in our program. You know, when a pitcher comes set, we do not say step off. That is a big no-no. I don't say it. I don't use it. Um, so anytime that, and it's always, it's a growing process, right? Um, so anybody, you have to correct them right away. Hey, we don't say that here. Uh, we what don't say think? step up. So we, we use a term from coach Gillespie. We say black. Um, so that was, that was, um, I obviously got it from coach Savage. Um, coach Savage got it from, um, coach Gillespie. And the reasoning behind it was, as we've all had, is when the pitcher comes set, let's say you're in a first and third, the runner leaves early, you say step off, what do guys do? They, they all, and it's a balk, right? right? So basically right. what we have, the rule is you say black and it's one, 1,000, then you step off. And it's basically to try to calm, right? Calm, what do they say? Calmer, calmer minds prevail or whatever the quote yeah. is or something yeah. like that. And um, so that's really the theory behind it. So that's, that's what we do in our program. That's part of our, that's part of our verbiage within our program. So um, we, we implement that in our offense, in our defense, um, in our outfield play, in our catching play. There's verbiage. You don't say, um, you know, for trying to think of a good one, and there's slang terms for something, right? For the ball that's down the middle, you get the immature player that's like, that ball was – x this and you're like no we don't talk like that the the ball was you know it's like no different than how you identify with pitch locations no the ball is not outside that's where was the ball oh it was a fastball four okay got it not outside Mm -hmm. you know where was the ball the ball was in no what is the it's fastball three you know okay we're trying to throw a ball off the plate that means it's an extra fine or whatever it may, I mean, that's our, that's part of our lingo every day. And the more you can have that, the more consistent your player's communication will be, and they will learn how to communicate more effectively. And that's what you're trying to do. Not that they're going to communicate better or more. You want them to be effective. Sure. You know, I, I think that's fantastic. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we've talked, to, we've been on a recruiting quite a bit and uh okay. one of the one of the questions on the sidebar was about recruiting too but uh my question was is there anything particularly particular that you look for and and it, for some reason uh urban meyer piqued my interest in this last weekend and he was on this podcast called focus three 
Mm-hmm. And I've never, I've never recruited in my life, but I thought this was fascinating, so I wanted to share it. But uh, he said that whenever he got to Utah, he had an assistant coach who was there for like 10 or 15 years. And he said they went to some like podunk town and, and were sitting down and he was just talking to everybody. And, and so Urban, you know, being the guy he is and in charge, he said, hey, we don't do that here. And the guy goes, oh, okay, so, so let, me, let me run you through my process. You know, you talked earlier about giving away uh, and delegating some different things. And he said, uh, he said, this is something that's never failed me. He said, I go to all of these little towns and I ask, who's the toughest player that you've ever coached against? Like, who's, who's the guy in this area or in this state that you just cannot, you can, like, you can't stop him. You, you want to give him the ball whenever, you know, whatever. And he said that he said, so he let him do it. And he said, it turned into like Alex Smith. And he said, every single one, almost every single one of them without fail was, uh, was like, not necessarily just like the one-to-one like Alex Smith was, but he was like multi-year starters and just different things like that. And so I'm all, I, it, I, for some reason, it just, it, it really piqued my interest on in what people look for. And so what are you looking for on the recruiting trail? And then uh, I mean, uh, that's obviously affected you guys now. And I, I don't even know, like, how do you even recruit right now with no games going on? Well, I think there's a lot. The recruiting, I mean, there's there there's uh, there's a science to it. You know, I, I think um, I, I think not, good teams don't really change in the, in the fact of, you know, the middle of the field's a big deal. I think um, – I think – there's my dogs, two of them. The mailman too. Hey, sorry about that. No, you're good. Um, you're good. Um, I got two boxers, so the mailman came up to the door. So uh, um, you better walk you out. <laughs> so don't come into the house, I guess. <laughs> um, but I think you want to build. You know, you want to build in the middle of the field. Um, that's that's the biggest deal. You want to build in the middle of the field. Um, catcher, shortstop center field I think that's number one um, and, and obviously you know your starting pitchers are involved in that and then your back end guys are involved in that but um, the recruiting I think it's based on what can what can your coaches or your what do you guys believe in you know that's number one what do you guys believe in um, what do you guys what can your coaches help uh, I don't want to use the term fix uh, but what can they help grow the player in and what can't? What don't they want to deal with? Um, for instance, uh, when I was recruiting under Coach Savage, you, you know, going out to see a pitcher was—I mean, it, it was probably three or four things. Um, and if they didn't check the box, it, I just walked away. It, I mean, it didn't really. Um, there was no, well, this or that. No, there was no mm-hmm. him and an on. It's like, okay, you got you got to have a standard. I think for what you want and it's the same with me now in my position as a head coach it's I, I still got to understand what coach Buckley wants in a pitcher what does he want does he want more you know can he fix the heel lander or um, what about the open toe what about you know a low front side what about a shovel front side I, I need to know what he wants um, in terms of going out and seeing these guys and I think that's part of it I think where we get into problems as high school program, or not, sorry, not high school, but college programs, I think we get into some problems um, is we just go right off the bat and you're like, hey, this guy throws 96, let's get him. Well, yeah, maybe, uh, but what what can he do? And I think part of, part of understanding recruiting is you got to hold on to a tool. And I think you have to, as whether it's a travel coach, a high school coach, a private coach, a college coach and because we're all selling them to different levels to the level mm-hmm. above us what you have to be honest with the tool what can they do not that they were just on you know they were just the area player of the year but what can he do tell me what he can do at this level hold on to something um so the tools don't change for us uh, really it's arm strength feeling ability speed Power average, you know, I think power is a, is a, is a little different in, in our level, um, but I, I think that that's it's the same in, the, in in professional baseball, and that's obviously where we've adopted those tools. I think as we dive deeper into the player for us, it's mental toughness. It's um, is this guy self confident? Um, is he coachable? 
um, you know, all those, all those things. And I think that's probably where the disconnect between the different programs, whether it's the private coach and, and I always, I'm a big advocate. I love high school baseball. I mean, I, I mean, to this day when I'm allowed and I can, I go back to my high school for the football games, mm -hmm. um, you know, at St. John Bosco, I, I love high school football. So, um, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of high school sports um, because, and, and I use those guys, you know, and it's whether it's in our area or other areas because they see these guys quite a bit. They see them eight hours a day, you know, and it's a lot of what professional baseball is doing too. It's they see, uh, or we see our guys eight hours a day. We see them in school. We see them off the field. We see them in the weight room. Uh, those are big things. Those are telling signs a lot more than just what they can do physically. Um, you know, so I, the, you know, basically the off the field things, what we look for is, is drive, mental toughness, determination, responsibility, self-control, self-confidence, coachability, baseball intelligence. Does he fit into the system? And the last one that's, I think is completely overlooked. Does he come from a winning program? You know, and I think I, I think those are huge, um, and we're going through it right now um, on the recruiting side as we're trying to mass video, and we're we're actually we're adopting. I think everybody now is adopting football, you know, because I don't know how football does it. I'm like trying to watch a guy swing, and I'm like, yeah, it looks okay, but I'm just more visual, and I want to be there and have a feel. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I can't. Football does it. And I can't. I. I probably should call our football department and ask them what's uh, – how do they do it every day. Um, but that's what we're trying to do now. And, the, you know, there's only so much I can see physically or our staff. And But I'll tell you what, I dive back into the numbers and in the terms of grad transfers right now or the one-time transfer rule at some point is going to pass, I think, later this spring. And – What's the guy do? Yeah, he's 6'3", 215, and it looks great. And we, he's left-handed, and we need a left-handed bat. Well, he's a career 210 hitter. Well, you know, so what – how the numbers, they, they, they tell a story. They, tell, they don't tell the whole story, but they tell part of the story. And the other part is, like I said, I think the other thing that's underestimated, and this is what I learned from John, was where do, the, do they come from winning programs? Because we're trying to win a national championship. I mean, that's the bottom line. That's what's been embedded, you know, since my days at playing at Long Beach State. And going into when I finally won one in 13, I mean, you look at those players that were on that field that day, they all come from winning programs. I mean, it's crazy. Whether it's Hart High School, whether it's Bishop Amon High School, whether it's Beckman, I mean, I can name a billion of them. Um, but they all won. And so – you just don't wake up every day and know how to win. I mean, that's that, you know, or we would all be, we'd all have national championships. And I think, um, I think those are big telling signs. I love that. And, and uh, we've, uh, we've been at it for a little over an hour. So we probably, well, uh, almost an hour and a half, which I've loved every <laughs> minute of it, but we'll get to some of the, some of the sidebar questions and some yeah. hitters and then, and then we'll, uh, but let's go ahead and start with, so, uh, Donegal would like to know who has a better oh, beard or Jason Kelly. Well, he he wants to know who has a better. I need to see Fergie. Is he still on there? Where's he at? There, there's Fergie. <laughs> I, well, be, I'm gonna throw Fergie. I'm gonna throw Fergie. He's 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 he by far has a better beard because I like the touch of gray. Okay. Uh, and, and that that just means he's getting wiser, not older. He's getting wiser. Um, so I'm going to go Fergie and the other part is Fergie talks to me a lot more than JK. So that's, so he's going to win on that Avenue as well. Although I did text JK, we were texting last night. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute, uh, Donegal or Fergie. As yeah, you let's call get him, Fergie going. Fergie, what's rebuttal. happening? What's going on? This is Fergie, great, man. How are you, buddy? Good, when are we, man, when are we going to the lake? Hey, I'm in right now. I can't. I wish I could take my computer outside and show you guys this DMX track I got going on. It's in my front yard. It's unbelievable. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I just want 
I, I do want to pick back. I actually have a serious point to make. Um, yep. Because uh, Tej and I, um, we laugh about Jason Kelly, who's pitch coach at Arizona State, who's a really good friend of both of ours, and um, connected us. Obviously, Jason and I coached at, at UW together. Um, I just think it's it, people should know that you know. And you, you mentioned it, Tej, just sort of your transformation about you, you know your family being more involved and and the way you interact with your staff and your players and whatnot. And I I should just tell the story that. Uh, when TJ and I first started to, to be around each other, he didn't like me very much because he didn't know what to do with me. Um, <laughs> the weird guy with the beard and, and breathing and, and just the ridiculous haircuts and, and all of the shit that, that I just um, bring to the table there. TJ didn't really know what to do with me. And um, we've got to be friends because I think one of the cool things about him is he, I've seen it just in the last few years, just the, the expansion of, of the way he looks at, at his role and, and who he is and someone who is uh, clearly comfortable in their own skin and not afraid to be who they are, but knowing that, um, like you mentioned earlier, people to fill in your gaps. And I think it's one of the really, really important things in coaching um, that, that often gets overlooked. We all want drills and we all want uh, um, approaches and we all want technique and all that good stuff. But being really comfortable in who you are and what you're good at and finding other people to help you and, and fill, fill in those gaps is, is so big and, and so critical. And, um, and that's, you know, the guys that are on this call obviously have that mindset and, and you've, you've seen the, the rush of, of webinars and stuff over, over the last um, little bit here and sheets and you and, and all the guys that are doing all these, these great things on Twitter. It's that, that's such a cool thing for me to see because um I just think it's the, maybe the most important thing in coaching is to be the real version of you. And, uh, and you know, if you're, if you're intense and quiet and, and focused on the simple stuff like, like Tej or, or if you're ridiculous like me, it, it can all work if we surround ourselves with really good people. And uh, so I, I just want to make sure uh, I put my two cents in about um, how, how cool I think uh, it is that, that Tej is, is talking about that, some, some of that stuff, because um, our, our uh, relationship has certainly changed. <laughs> over the years and and we laugh about it now because it's it's so funny but uh but i think it's it's one of the really cool things about our, our game and, and the people in it uh that uh that you can do it so many different ways and be really good at it so uh hats off to you Tej, and, and uh keep up the good work buddy i appreciate it fergie and it's funny i, I can elaborate a little bit too I, uh we're uh, and i know we, we can be on there all day but we're at washington i was uh, fergie was at washington ucla and i was at ucla and he comes in, and if you remember, for you had like this arrow or something like you hold the sign to position the defense. You know, J.K. did the pitching, and Fergie had this ridiculous sign. And I'm like, who is this guy? That, yeah, this guy's trying to change college baseball. This isn't how it's done. And you know, I was a know-it-all, and I'm like, this is you know, blah blah blah. And and I and I do, and I think, I, and just I'm gonna keep piggybacking, but it's like. Part of it is, is I think why we do criticize that stuff and why I did was because of it, you're insecure and your insecurities of based on where you did come from or where I came from or whatever. I just became insecure that I was a worse coach if my kids were on the field. I was a worse coach if I wasn't laughing. I was a worse coach. And that's not – that that's completely the other way um, that – that I looked to Fergie finally and was like, Hey, how do you do this? And how, and, and now it's every time we see each other, even for playing, man, it's big hugs. It's laughing in the, across the dugout. And this was even just to a year or two ago when he was in Santa Barbara before he, he went to professional baseball. But uh, now it's a big deal that, that you do have to lean on the people around you because they will help you get better. And, and more importantly, they're going to help you be better family guys, such as, Fergie has and it was um, I am more engaged with my kids now because I've seen guys like him do both and um, and the other thing is you do man you got to be 100% comfortable if you're a yeller be a yeller I'm not I'm not as dynamic out as and crazy as Fergie is um, I can't try to do that now we can do that if, if Tim and I but um, I, I'm just not that way partly because I still I'm, I'm trying to be who I am, but I'm not comfortable that. And if you're not being who you are, your players will, will not succeed. Um, and that's why partially um, – that's just a little bit of why I do love who he is because he, he doesn't care about – he cares about one thing, and that's his family, 
or a few things, family and two is players. And, and he's who he is. And it's, it's, uh, it's fun to see. I, mean, I do miss him in college baseball, but I am for sure a hundred percent happy he's out of college baseball. So Fergie, I'm glad I, I would have picked you to go to professional baseball. So that's good. Appreciate you, buddy. <laughs> well, guys, I, don't, I honestly don't think there's any, any better way to end the show than that. But I mean, I'll, I'll just open it up for you. Uh, thank you for the 20 plus guys that, that tuned in. It was, man, it was fun to actually see some live people and not just talking face to face or even just on a mic uh, for an hour and a half, but I enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot. I'm trying to take notes and listen to this stuff as well. But uh, to these guys or to any of the listeners on the podcast or YouTube or wherever they're listening right now, do you have anything else for them? You know, I, I just appreciate it. I, I think, um, I, like, part of what you just heard, um, a lot of this things about relationships, um, and it's about people. And I think that's what we got to understand is that we're people first um, before we're coaches. Um, I, I do think – like I told you, is your family mission is going to carry into um, into your your baseball mission or your work mission, whatever you are doing. But um, I, I, I just don't stop learning. Um, and, and I think you guys surround yourself with great people, and you can't be afraid that that you don't know everything. And or, you know you can't be afraid to show your players that you don't know everything. You know, and that's another thing. It's like, hey, if I can't. Uh, if I don't may know something about hitting, which I don't know everything about hitting and, and for con contest, we're completely opposite people when it comes to an offensive approach, um, just based on how we've coached against each other. And so now it's like, Hey, why would, why would I not put um, our best hitter on the phone with him right now in the off season? It may, it may help our guy. And that that's where I think communication comes from. So uh, I, I appreciate it, man. There, there's a ton of – I got a ton of respect for everybody that does this and everybody on this call because they're trying to learn. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and, and a part of not knowing everything, I mean, look at – I keep bringing him up, but look at Fergie's a minor league hitting coordinator and, he, and he's on a podcast. And it's mm -hmm. basically become – he just he's just a learner, and that's what he is. It's a learner first. Pete Savage is on the call, who I think is one of the greatest high school coaches ever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and – um, you know, these guys just they're, – they're successful for a reason because they don't stop learning, and that, that's number one. So don't stop learning. Uh, push through this thing. Um, I know we're in an odd time, but be, be positive. I mean, you, you got to create positivity and you got to be an encourager, and I think that's, uh, that's what we're all here to do. All right. Thanks again, TJ. Have a great day. No problem, See guys. See you guys.